think the last time I spoke was quite a few years ago when I was talking about vector functional programming. So it's all, now it's now for something completely different, I think, is the phrase. Um, whenever people talk about uh, legacy and so on, they either call Michael Feathers or me, it seems. Uh, me because I'm old and Michael Feathers because he's got the best-selling book. Um, uh, this is, uh, I wish I had, uh, uh, just in case you're hoping that I'm going to show you that you can just code your architecture, I'm, I'm sorry, you'll be disappointed. Uh, Gregory's following now, so he'll show you that even with Amazon now, you might be able to uh, start coding your infrastructure instead of using that terrible stuff they had before. So. So really what I'm going to talk about is the co-evolution of architecture. And you know, if you're in a really small project, this you know, probably isn't relevant to you. Uh, but if you worked uh, in any things which uh, my good friend Brian Foote named the excellent pattern called the big ball of mud, um, most people um, in a, you know, real products or organizations seem to have some parts of their code that are not ideal. So just quickly, um, the outline, I'm going to talk briefly about architects and, and architecture. I'm going to talk also quite briefly about agile architecture. Um, and then I want to talk about the, mo the model code gap, uh, basically, because we all know that code runs away from architecture. And then I want to talk about the importance of co-evolution and how you can do that and some practices for doing that. And uh, that's really it. And uh, just so my, my grandchildren were over just as I was doing these slides. And so I thought, well, I want to show them how cool I am. So I'll just do a, uh, agile architecture with Dolly. And that's the picture that AI came up with. So, <laughs> so architecture is really the simplest abstraction of a complex product which means that architecture, by definition, is a lie, right? So you could say that if you're an architect or people working in architecture, part of what you're doing is managing a set of lives, lies or stories, so that people can actually you know, get the gist of what the system is about without getting lost in the detail. So that's really, it's really important for seeing or what we call envisioning what your product is going to be like and how it's going to interact. It's very important for being able to talk and discuss coupling and cohesion, which are two words that everybody uses and very few people understand. Uh, and people actually think that they're complementary. Some people are in opposition, and in fact, they're both. The essential architecture is a key set of things that we need to understand to work on the system. And an architecture should allow you to sort of plan. So in general, you know, you want to have the architecture on the wall. I mean, the principle of lean is that basically if something's important, you should make it visible. Now, I hate to say what most people's architecture looks like when they show it to me. Uh, maybe I only go to the places that, you know, don't know what they're doing. But uh, unfortunately, love. And the, the big thing, of course, is that uh, Fred Brooks basically made Conway, Mel Conway famous because he really coined the term Conway's Law. But in Fred's book, Mythical Man Month, basically he gave the key phrase, which uh, for four decades has really been the badge of people who built large products. Unfortunately, you ship your organization. So you, know, you can pick any of the ugly ducklings that I worked on, and I can show you the seams. I can tell you that those teams were split between different geographies or split ideologically between the teams. So now there's a wonderful new book on uh, topologies and so on. But the key thing is the architecture very much influences their product. And uh, in general, it will always be visible even when you don't want it to. So it's a way to do this. Now, for me, an architecture is really just a set of APIs. <laughs> Hopefully not too many. Uh, so in many cases, um, when someone says they have a REST architecture, uh, that means they have thousands of APIs to me. But 
what I expect is a few APIs that are fairly general purpose, and I'll come back to that. And there's a set of illities, which are continuous to deliver. Illities are the you know, those non-functional properties, you know, usability, you know, you know, reliability, all those things that you should have tests for that run all the time. And I'm sure, you know, being you know, super smart Australians and here in WA, you all continuously test your abilities, your performance, and so on. So you always know every build that nothing's changed, right? You get your flame graphs now, you have those as well. So. And so, and it's also the set of practices, techniques, or patterns that you use. Um, so I think we all accept that's what architecture is about. Now, architecture to me is not a job. An enterprise architect is an oxymoron. You know, I don't know what an enterprise architecture is. I understand that some of you are not really enterprise architecture, but they gave you that name, so I'm not picking on you because they named you the wrong way. But in general, to me, uh, when people build software, everybody gets a little bit of, you know, sort of paint on you. So you get some green paint if you happen to be from doing some testing. You get some red paint if you happen to be, you know, crashing the system. You know, at some point, we're all doing architecture, design, writing code, testing, making sure things work with the customer. So this is a holistic notion, and the notion that, um, so in most organizations, uh, that I've been involved with, there are no architects. Uh, there are principal engineers or distinguished engineers who typically are the leaders. Some of them have teams, uh, large development teams, maybe hundreds of developers. Some are individual contributors, but they're peers. And so they're the key leaders, and it's really... The other thing that's important is I don't really believe in what I call post-technical architects. If you can't smell code burning, and you can't read code, then you, you shouldn't be working in an architecture role. I'm sorry. Um, pretty scary look at how old I am. You know. But I can still smell code burning. And if you write it in a decent language, I can read it. Unfortunately, um, that's not true for all of them. So the, the main thing is that you really do have a sense, and good architects spend a fair bit of time walking around talking to people because they're carrying the essence of their system in their head and sharing it. Now, uh, Agile was inspired by something called Lean. Unfortunately, it became a religion. Um, I was at the, I did the keynote of the first XP conference and I, I can remember my slide. Does, does XP stand for you know, excellent practices or xenophobic programming? And we know that we have both extremes, craftsmen being at the xenophobic end. How to make something that isn't very interesting look very pretty. Um, a lot of time nasal gate. So we really want to be able to, very simple, lean has very simple principles. Basically, you know, get in the flow and make things flow faster, increase the value, reduce waste, and you do that by learning more and more about the system and about the domain. Domain knowledge is actually really important. I'll just mention this now because lots of people spend time basically with agile teams. They get, they get the story, it's a big worm, but you know, the, the developers don't understand the domain so you have to cut it up in little pieces and feed it to the developers so they can implement it. You much better invest in teaching the developers about the domain. Domain knowledge is the critical thing for competitive, and in order to do modeling, particularly event modeling, uh, the money's in the domain knowledge. So very, very important. Uh, the principles we've used since, uh, I think, uh, API First came out of the Eclipse project is basically we always start first with the API, so the components, and you know, keep a visible architecture so people could see what it is, and this is the only way you can share it. The last thing is not a surprise to anyone. Good things happen if you do everything continuously. When Ward, Cunningham, and Kent started doing refactoring, they were talking about making changes over hours and days, not waiting till, you know, basically they'd made a big mess and started begging for technical debt cards. 
But and then, and uh, I will mention that you know, people should just stop using the word refactoring because you're all lying. You know, refactoring is equivalence preserving. And when you tell your management you're just going to refactor, you're lying through your teeth and you all know it. You're basically, you're going to rip and tear the hell out of the code and make it better. But you don't have enough tests to make it equivalent preserving. And you don't want it to be equivalent. That's why you're refactoring it. So very important uh, that we do those things continuously. So um, this is a quote from me in Agile Architecture, basically. In the early days, everyone thought that it was a, you know, I won't blame any people, but if you know the uh, many of my friends who started the, uh, uh, the naive Agilista, basically, we don't need no stinking documentation, design, anything else. Everything will be emergent, and that's just emergent bullshit. Words shouldn't use So here's the lies you hear. No upfront design, no architecture. Just clean code. Sorry. Um, basically, a feature only development. We don't need any components or anything like that. We'll just build features. We won't worry about interference between features. It's all going to be great. We'll refactor versus when you're really rewriting. We'll have emergent everything architecture, design. It'll just pop out and it'll be beautiful. Right? I mean, I love Neil Ford, but, you know. To Neil, everything's, everything's evolutionary because he's seen all the patterns. But most other people don't have the architectural experience of Neil Ford, so they can't realize, oh, right, what you need is a split three-tier server with this sort of pattern between it and event bus and so on. Um, you know, it's nice stuff, but it's just not the real world. Unit testing versus acceptance tests. I'll give you 10 cents for an acceptance test and $10 for a good acceptance, for, sorry, for an acceptance test and 10 cents for a unit test. So many people waste so much time writing unit tests and they're fragile and they break, yet they don't have acceptance tests. You should be testing your abilities with acceptance tests. That's what the customers buy. Customers buy the acceptance tests. And our fixed price, by the way, I agree with Adam, uh, we've guaranteed, we had a process that we basically would tell the customer, we have a thing called just-in-time software. We contract for something, we don't deliver it on time, you don't pay for it. We did that for literally 20 products, including you know, virtual machines, uh, programming environments, and you know, it's just possible to do that, but you have to have a disciplined process for doing it. And then there's this other you know, rage thing, X is bad, Y is good, in what context? You know, event sourcing is an incredibly powerful technique, but it's not the answer for everything. And that would be the first to tell you. Uh, but neither is you know, doing programming in Rust or Lisp or your other favorite programming language. Everything needs judgment. So in the beginning, of course, we all know about the naive, agile story. Trust the code, Luke. Basically, go quickly. We get a mess. And then, you know, we refactor it. Just doesn't work. Refactoring tools are terrible. They're toys for little boys. I mean, move method. You know, I have to move thousands of methods. Most pe things that people want to refactor are serious. You know, what people want is they want a button on their code their legacy system where they punch the button that says fix it. Spending five years to refactor your monolith into a series of microservices, probably dependency preserving, right? People do that. They still can't deploy the microservices because they're still just got dependencies. Seems like a pretty silly thing to do, but that's what we're doing because the architectures are limited. So the first lesson we learned very quickly in the Agile world is basically um, all this rhetoric from the so-called Agile consultants uh, is really toy talk. This works. I mean, it's a good idea to have literate programming. It's a good idea to use patterns. Uh, it's nice to have uh, clean code, but a product it does not make. 
and an architecture it doesn't make. So the real thing I find when I go into lots of companies, and typically, you know, I can smell software burning. It doesn't take long. Basically, you know, within hours in a company, you can tell, you know, this, there's a real big software smell in this company. You can tell by the rhythm. You can sense the build rhythm and the bumps as the, it's not continuous. So the real challenge is everybody starts off with a nice sort of architecture. And then something happens. The money comes in, the project gets pushed, more people get thrown on it, and now the code takes over. So this whole system is really owned by the programmers. And uh, here, clear they're, they're, they're doing something here. They found there's a whole lot of valuable frameworks, you know, like React. Ah, you got React 1. Now you have to rewrite your entire app because Facebook realized React 1 was a dog. So you have to go to React 3. People are wasting their entire lives just rewriting it to someone else's framework. That's not architecture. That's just grabbing code from different people. So why do we get this drift? It's simple because code is concrete and changes and can change very quickly. Architecture is this sort of intangible thing. So until we find a way, which we probably never will, to make architecture and code the same, which is happening now, and we'll hear from Gregor later about infrastructure as code, that's very promising. But we're certainly nowhere near there. So that means we're going to have to invest in some techniques for keeping our architecture you know, refactored, cleaned up in a healthy state. So we're going to have to talk about continuous architecture. I'm not looking to define another buzzword, by the way, but we just need to be looking at how can we keep our architecture evolving so that when we bring new people in, or when we have to talk about what we used to do, we have a way to go and look at that and have the artifacts and so on that are in place to do that. And uh, George Fairbanks, who wrote a wonderful book called Just Enough uh, Software Architecture, uh, defined this thing called the code model gap. And the important thing to understand is that models are really useful. Uh, they can be equations, uh, they can be simulations. They're just models. They allow us to understand partial reality. So models are a slice of life, they're not life. So the architecture can never be a model. And the only time you can get a real picture from the code is you know, if you look at the entire code base, you will get one of the lovely drawings you'll see later, which are really useless. You know, there's all sorts of wonderful tools. Uh, sonar, and again, basically, sonar gives you this tangled mess, and you know, someone points out, well, look, here's the problem. Now, first of all, everybody in the room already knew that was the problem. Right? But then again, what the boss is looking for, oh, OK, so just draw a button on it and push, fix it. The point is, you have to try and keep your architecture visible so you know about these problems ahead of time. So models are good, but models are not reality. And here's some of these wonderful pictures. Uh, the, you know, the one at the top there is, of course, the latest uh, visualization of microservices, which was really useful because it tells you that everything talks to almost everything else. Really handy. And then you've got ones that look at it from a city point of view. And, uh, the point is, you know, if you look at any serious product with these tools, you just get a massive line and boxes. So unfortunately, you know, the tools are just not here yet. And I might question whether they're ever going to be here. Because there's just a fundamental difference between having an abstraction that helps you understand something that gives you a partial view and something that tells you the real truth. So the key practices for co-evolution are, first of all, to share the really big story. The second thing is to basically try and manage your architecture as though it is code. So you know, put it in the art, art, make sure that your architecture is continuously being versioned like your code. Code the architecture where possible, and I'll explain what that is. 
and try and leverage. There are certain design patterns and approaches and styles which allow you to reduce the difference between the code uh, and the architecture. Particularly true, uh, one being mentioned is the functional style, which is now quite popular, even with things like Lambda, which uh, unfortunately it's not a Lambda, but uh, the usual, you know, the marketing people take a name that meant something and turn it into something else. And we want to capture this essential architecture and then maintain the ill at ease and the dependencies. So the essence is the vision or the really big story, or XP called it the metaphor. And I can't stress how important that is, and I'll give a couple examples. It's very important that everybody in the company understands the essence, the essential architecture for the thing you're working on. And the best way to do this is through storytelling because people are very good at remembering stories, and the best storytellers are often the architects or the principal engineers. So they can show you the styles, the patterns, and the models, and the key ideas. I had you know, several experiences, but uh, three I'll relate to you. The first one, when I was fairly young, I worked on, on a computer system called Xerox Data Systems. Uh, very interesting system. I was sent away with a colleague uh, to a university in the United States to learn about this operating system not your normal course. Two people with each holding chalk uh, at the board, you can tell how long ago it was, basically talked about, going, went through the entire operating system, drawing processes, going between them, drawing data structures, just going back and forth. It was incredible, but somehow we followed it. Two days, everything about what was going on inside the operating system, and then they said, Everybody have a good dinner because we have something special for you uh, on Thursday night. We take in the computer room and they crash the machine. What went wrong? This system was all implemented in assembler language, but it was very table driven, which was the badge of honor in those days. That's how you made things modular and flexible. You turned everything into data. There's a lesson there. Um, and what we're able to do is in a period of two or three hours, we're able to find each of the teams why the system had crashed. We went through those tables, you know, basically with a printout this big, a hex core dump, right? Um, nice, we had big paper then, so it was much easier you could write on it. I miss that paper so much, you keep notes beside it. Great for code reviews and everything. And we learned very quickly. Um, Similarly, um, Nortel's just down the street from me, or was before it was decimated. Still a fragment of it there. Uh, we, you know, George Smith, who was one of the key architects of the DMS switch, is a very common switch. Basically, he, and I forget the other, I think it was Bill Bowen, the other uh, key architect, basically you know, 300 new grads joined in there, and they said, okay, in the next three days, we're gonna teach you everything you need to know about call processing. And they went through the same thing, two people interacting, diagrams, how things worked. After you'd had that story from them, which may have lasted anywhere, depending on your session, there were short ones, four hours, uh, there were two or three day ones, you could go work anywhere in the company, and you had a mental model about what was important with regard to call processing. These stories are very, very important. And the last two are about involving my own personal you know, activity at OTI, basically. Um, we started the business and we wanted a vision for the business. And uh, you may know I tend to work a lot in strange programming languages or exotic languages, I should call them. And we basically said, okay, small talk, mainframe to a watch. That was our business plan. Basically, we were going to take small talk and we were going to put it everywhere. And by 1995, uh, it ran on the IBM mainframe and we got it onto a pager, but we didn't get it onto a watch. But we built the Sony Qualcomm early phones long before Apple, 1995, basic location of movies and so on before the infrastructure was there. But the key thing is everybody had a simple model. 
this is what we're going to do in order, to, in order to make small things, we have to do these things. In order to make large things, we have to make these things. Uh, very simple. And again, uh, when we built Eclipse, and Jav, I apologize if you use Eclipse, basically, you know, it was a good idea. We did it too fast. And then IBM bought Rational and pulled all the money out before the third release really came out. But yeah, it's a software business. Um, again, we basically started um, a year behind. Um, Sun had released the first uh, Java. Uh, it was pretty slow. If you ever, you, you should try running the old Java. Uh, it, bear, it really limped along. Uh, we had no access to the source code because uh, we knew that IBM was uh, going to really out to, uh, sorry, that Sun was really out to screw IBM and Microsoft and everybody else. Um, so they had a viral, nasty viral license. I won't go into the horrible business details. So basically, we had to tell the story. It says, okay, so what we have to do is we have to basically make Sun disappear in terms of the Java space. We were, we were not even on the map when we started. Um, but within two years, we built both the Eclipse IDE and the Java virtual machines and were competitive to Sun. And again, that was done through a series of stories for each of the pieces, uh, describing these and how they went together, uh, told by the architects uh, with the teams working across the world. You know, Eric Gama had the UI uh, based in uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, funny story. Some of you may know that uh, Eclipse is extendable with an API, which Eric was very proud of. Um, but it's a very brittle, difficult API. Um, those of us in Ottawa who had a lot of background in small talk and flexible scripting wanted it to be a scriptable environment. But Eric said, no, that's tricks too long. We won't be able to do it. And I think Eric was made the right decision there in terms of the time frame because we needed to ship. However, uh, you will find that there's maybe something you like quite a bit today called Visual Studio Code built by the same team with Eric Gramma, except this time it's very scriptable, and that's why Visual Studio Code is, I think, so successful. So you, know, you learn early that you, you get stuck with the decisions you make, so you have to think a lot about them. But those really big stories are very, very important. So I just want to now go through some, some things that can help you capture as much of your architecture as possible in concrete form. The first thing I think everyone knows is that you want to basically capture your API definitions and version them, uh, whether you use Swagger or not. I don't really, you know, that's not particularly important to me. You want to use infrastructure as code, and uh, I believe uh, I happen to like Pulumi, but uh, CDK is coming along, and I suspect you're going to hear from Gregor on that since he's now working for uh, the dark side at AWS, from, previously from the dark side at Google. Um, diagrams as code is a really handy thing for doing, you know, one of the problems, you know, I really like the work that uh, Simon Brown does here because he actually teaches people to do some basic visual stuff so people can describe their stuff. So. Uh, C4 model and uh, his tool structurizer is a nice way to get at least designs. Uh, it doesn't really scale for large scale architectures. Um, model constrained code, there are actually th UML models and other ML models for certain kinds of industries that work. I'm not pushing that people should get UML out of the closet. I like to keep it in the closet. Uh, but there are some well established patterns there. And there's a lot of things now called low code. Now, how many people in this room really want to go write low code? Well, unfortunately, the industry is getting so complicated, it's driving a lot of people in this market to start using low code tools. And if you looked at that low code, it might actually start looking a lot like some of the things that Peter was showing. Yesterday, in fact, you'll probably see that uh, I predict that um, there already is some examples at AWS, but there's a lot of work at AWS uh, and other cloud providers to try and bring simpler tools so that people can just configure things instead of uh, having them. You want to be able to look 
you know, keep track of data. Why is it that programmers are so concerned about code and don't care about data? Data is much easier to change if you need to. It actually doesn't change very often. Schemas are actually fairly stable. Um, you can do a lot of things with data. Uh, data is a very important thing, which unfortunately most developers know very much, don't know very much about. That also includes query, of course. That's why we have NoSQL, because the developers don't want to learn it, and because they can very easily store everything in a blob so every other poor user who wants it gets to write a parser, you know, so that you know, everybody in the company has 300 parsers to try and take the JSON blob apart. Really stupid. You know. <laughs> Just let them eat. Oh, and we should have it schemaless too. There's a very large, successful Australian company that the only way they can do their analytics is by knowing the date that this JSON schema changed. I made a mistake of naming them sometime, but I won't this time. <laughs> Domain models, and again, immutable data is really key, event sourcing, streaming, and so on. You want to leverage the architecture styles, so you can do this. So basically, use black box components, not frameworks. Frameworks inject dependencies into your code. Basically, you were fine before, you got this framework, now you have to reach inside it, it reaches back into you. If you're really unlucky, it'll send events. And you have to have a hook and an adapter and everything else. Um, so you look at what happens and React just took over your entire application. Yeah, model view controller, all these things. Why do we have the event loop? Oh, well, I'll tell you. The event loop first came up on the Alto computer, which is where small talk at Xerox Park was done, and the interrupts didn't work. So because the interrupts didn't work, they had to pull uh, to see whether the disk I.O. completed, whether the mouse moved, and everything. And that became the controller in MVC. And after that, everybody else who didn't really want to, couldn't really understand how small talk worked, copied it, so we ended up with a crappy event loop on every machine, and the fact that only in BOS did we have concurrent windows, which were real processes that you could use. So what we took is took a bad pattern, well, a pattern that was reasonable because they had to get work, the hardware wasn't working, and it got cloned, and then we have 10,000 MVC frameworks all trying to fix a problem which they can't because the event loop is bad. And, you know, if you think that gets fixed by, uh, you know, the asynchronous Rx, Java, or whatever it is, it has very complicated state machines underneath. So it makes it look like, oh, it's easy, it's just a stream. Eric Meyer's a good friend of mine, and he's the primary criminal responsible for this. And basically, but it's still really complicated if you want to know what's really going on. All because we didn't really look at the architecture and said, we should, should get rid of this event loop should make this into a real concurrent program. Pipelines, data flow. Uh, you might find out that your granddad used something called data flow diagrams. Um, you know, they were considered bad because you would take them and shake them and then you'd turn them into a tree of code and everything like that. Except uh, the people in Japanese banks who actually realized that they could just run these concurrently. So they just made every process concurrent and with data flowing between it. And if you've seen Fred George, basically Fred George, most of, the, most of the services he builds are simple data flow services. That's a great way to build uh, a great new technique for building microservices from the 60s or 70s. Functions, we've talked about. This is a favorite of mine, a hobby horse, mainly because they've saved me in many situations Table-driven programming. Decision tables, state tables, uh, which now are represented by step, step functions, or even in React now we've got, you know, it's complicated enough now with the states that you have React state machines. So these are coming back to something called state charts. Uh, constraint tables, which are really just a fancy name for spreadsheets. These things are very flexible to change. We run applications 
which work on terabytes of data that run on a spreadsheet. You, know, you don't have to do, you know, you get a spreadsheet, the business can actually fill the spreadsheet in. You know, they figured out how to do this a while ago. And when, instead of having a whole lot of people writing all sorts of stupid cucumber junk, right, so you can build fragile tests that break uh, and try and do this and drive the poor product owner crazy because you're not writing the win. You can just take the spreadsheet and run it. It's a simple interpreter. Each of these can be implemented by a simple interpreter that'll run, whether it's in an embedded system, uh, uh, you know, game controller, or running an Amazon. Very powerful techniques, which people don't, and they're very fast to change because it's just data. You don't have to get a jar and figure out how to deploy it on a VM. You just change the data. Why don't we use these things? I uh, didn't teach me that at school, or it's not fun. It's a problem. We should look at these techniques. Sometimes we have to look back to look ahead. Well, fortunately, you know, state machines are being rediscovered through React, so a lot of people are hearing about those now. Unfortunately, it's not very good, but not many good books or teachers on the subject, but at least people are looking at it. You want to be able to annotate and version all the appropriate artifacts. You want to maintain a risk backlog. Basically, what's the risk, what's the impact, and what's the status? Very, very important. You want to update all the abilities based on acceptance tests so we always know whether the performance is there. We don't basically find out that we've done three releases and lost 30% of our performance. You need to do that every build. You want to track and publish your dependencies. We want to be able to add, annotate all the important artifacts in the code, including put in things like confessions that said, the code that's here really sucks. We wrote it this re for these reasons. It's really hairy, scary code. You know, be sure you understand what this is, as opposed to a nice comment or just some nice names. So we want to make sure that people know where the scary code is. Every system has scary code in it. Um, I may perhaps not your new system, uh, but it will in your next few hours or days. We want to do document the, you know, Mike, Michael Nygaard talks about ADRs, architecture decision records. You want to put those and version them in the code. So you can, but your code, so your code base will have all the architectural information in it. Notes from design reviews and code reviews that are important. I'm not talking about pouring everything in there, but put the important stuff in there and make sure that the major incidents, if there's major incident reports uh, that are in there, you want to put those there because the, knowing which part of the codes are fragile is very, very important. I think Adam Thornhill talked online. He said, Yao in December, uh, his code is a crime scene is a uh, great uh, talk and book. But basically, you know, what he does is he says, okay, we've got all these things that don't work, um, but the ones that are changing the most are the ones that are important because those are the ones people are trying to fix. So instead of trying to fix all the problems, he just focuses on those important changing problems. So having detailed analysis of the parts that are breaking is very, very important. Software, the hell of software is dependencies. Yet we often, you know, you, you, we can't do that because of the dependencies. What are the dependencies? Well. There's this one and that one and this one. You should track the dependencies. There's a very powerful tool called uh, a design state, the design state structure matrix, uh, which was invented for manufacturing, building complicated things like planes and so on. I think we're building pretty complicated things. And it allows you to essentially know and be visible what this is. I think this actually could be used as a design tool because the biggest problem in software is working on dependencies, is trying to deal with these dependencies. Obviously, if you can eliminate dependencies, it's a really, really great idea. Well, I want to conclude now, just in the last few minutes that I have, on uh, where I, I see this going. Um, and it's good news and bad news, as usual. Architectures, particularly the newer ones, are getting more and more dynamic. Brendan, we were talking last night, uh, he works at Intel, you know, we we're talking about the fact that maybe to make the firmware and the Intel processor uh, programmable. That'll be fun, eh? 
We, we can change the, what's going on in the kernel now with EPF, eBPF. Uh, maybe we could let you change the instruction set uh, on your processor so it would go faster for your workload. So now we're on the tower of the cake, and you know, I each think of each of these layers as kind of someone on roller skates, right? So you get on top, and you put another roller skate on that, and you get in the top, and you say, this is really good. Let's, let's take these down the stairs. This stuff is getting very complicated. So these systems are becoming very, very dynamic. And we have this wonderful idea that the customer should be able to do things themselves without talking to anybody, which is possible in many cases but it makes things very complicated. So these asynchronous microservices, by the way, asynchronous is, and event-driven is amazing, but when you start building fully asynchronous microservices, you have to understand the concurrent state machines are doing this. There are very few people who understand how to design and test concurrent state machines. And there is no book, to my knowledge, that explains this well. The best stuff is David Harrell in State Charts, which was done years ago. So be a little cautious before you embrace uh, you know, event asynchronous everything. <coughs> and if you're really interested in doing this, please read you know, uh, Joe Armstrong's thesis, uh, Joe did Erlang because it'll tell you pretty much everything you need to know about designing asynchronous services in a robust way. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's, a, it's the Bible for how to do uh, asynchronous system design. So exploring the architecture and the runtime views becomes essentially a matter of looking at the system as it's executing. So how do we get a picture of the architecture then? when everything's changing and new people are dying in? Well, one can only envision a world where you basically see your architecture by essentially looking at it through continuous analysis. Sorry. And if we actually look at modern tools, uh, I think VGW has honeycomb there. Hopefully that's not a big secret. Um, Honeycomb is basically an in-memory database with fast query. So the only way you can actually understand what these systems are doing is by essentially writing queries. By the way, I do believe that query is the future of programming. People today are building high-performance compilers by writing queries in data log. And one of the things, of course, that most computer science students do, hey, query. You know, SQL, go away. Um, SQL is going to be back in spades. And in my view, GraphQL should be really replaced by a relational model uh, because GraphQL with its, whatever they're called, providers, adapters, whatever it is, is really a pretty complicated patchwork. Um, the only API most people need in their REST system is query. But because we didn't want to you know, expose the data model and tell people what was out there, we have to make up 100, oh, yeah, we need another API. No problem, we'll put another squad on that. Right? Build yet another API that gets four fields, and the person who wants the fifth one will have to have another API because we can't change the other one because we have, you know, it just gets to be this mess. All you need is secure SQL and a data model. Why aren't we building simple services like queries? They work really well. The same technology is needed here to be able to understand runtimes. And I claim that future architects are going to basically be much like the SREs, uh, going to have to use these query tools because the only way you're going to actually understand these dynamic architectures is be it by being able to write sophisticated queries. That's quite a different world from where we are today. And I do please you know, make sure that uh, your brother or sister that's coming along isn't like you and go, I don't do data. Right. Data is really important. And you can do much more things with flexibility in data. And not nearly enough attention is paid to data architecture. I'm over time, so I'll shut up. Thank you.
All right, if anyone's listening online, feel free to pop a question in. In the meantime, we've got any, any takers in the audience? Corrective remarks are also fine. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, someone's got to have a question. There we go. Uh, thanks for the talk. I think a lot of it went over my head. I'm pretty new to architecture, so apologies if this is a dumb question. <laughs> There are uh, no dumb you, questions. The only dumb questions are the ones that don't get asked. Uh, I was just, yeah, hopefully pretty simple for you. I just want to know if there's a, a good example of implemented architecture that you could refer us to that you've seen lately in terms of both like a, I know that you were saying it's got to be sort of story based, but is there like a, like a story level of the architecture and some sort of design diagram sort of thing that we could look at? The problem is that examples um, you know, the things you, you you'd like to use to teach tend to be so small relative to do it. But you can certainly look at, the, there was a, a bunch of stuff done written by, um, largely I think by Eric Gama, called the Eclipse Way. Um, if you send me a note, I'll try and, uh, maybe I'll try and put the reference on the slides when I put them out. Um, I've been, you know, just so you know how hard these things are, I've been asking the event source community uh, for many years to sh have a nice example of event sourcing. And there's been several attempts, but they've never quite finished it. So you know, I've got one right here. So uh, we'll be getting that out too. So, um, but the problem is things get quite complicated quickly. Uh, so, but certainly um, there's a fair number of, of discussions now about architecture and um, uh, uh, Dave Farley, uh, who's gonna be uh, in Australia in December, has written a new book, uh, which I really recommend. It's called Modern Software Engineering, uh, uh, How to Build Software you know, Faster, Better. Um, now, the, the, the secret is there is nothing modern in the book. It's just all the stuff we know that people should know because we sort of stopped teaching this. I mean, you know, this is probably, un, you know, we maybe cut this, but basically the Australian education system with regard to software has really fallen apart. Uh, you know, I, if, if this is news to anyone, you feel free to crucify me, but basically I've been in Australia for 20, 30 years regularly. And so, and this is a problem globally that we have a lot of people that the, the you know, basic software engineering is not taught. You know, and you know, basically we're, we're really, you know, to speak to the earlier talk, we're big on showing people tools. Right, so, and if you talk to developers what they want, they want to learn this tool, that tool, the next tool, the next language, and so on. But the real issues are having conversation, like try and have a conversation about coupling and cohesion. Uh, yeah, we, we don't want any of that, or not too much of it, or it's very vague. So, uh, I, uh, that's my, my favorite a book because it's not too thick and it covers all of the all of the old stuff in a kind of new way and also talks about the continuous delivery and continuous testing which was slightly controversial but testing in production is quite a common practice today doing it correctly isn't quite as common a practice but uh, lots of lots of people are doing it so uh, I understand I've, I had I did this talk and in, uh, at the Agile Meets Architecture conference in Germany, and I had a surprising number of people come up to the audience and say, our teams don't know these words. I didn't use a lot of terms that are new. And so I think we have a serious issue to, to try and improve the, the, you know, the problem is we, we're big on training and not in education. And what we want to do is improve the education and the understanding and the ability to mentor engineers, and that takes time. Um, so the way I learned was by working with people that were way better than I was. But they had the time to show me, you know, this code is crap, right? You know, write it over again, right? It wasn't like, just ship it. I think, you know, the fact you're doing, you're doing you've got a velocity that's doing that just tells me your code base really is going to suck. Right, so. 
Thank you so much, Dave. Everyone give him a round of applause.